everybody. Am I on? Good morning. Nice to see you, Jeff. <laughs> It's all right, we can take our time, no problem. <laughs> Morning 146. I'm sure they're very quiet over there, very, very well behaved. We've got another gathering here. Good to see everybody. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> The Anglicans have got it worked out, haven't they? The, the, the statement and response, but uh, we're a bit slower on that. Um, <laughs> it's all getting out of hand. Right, we're going to uh, read a passage together, which is in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 25. And uh, let's, uh, no need to stand, let's uh, read this, shall we, together. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us all unswervingly to the faith that we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Amen. I hope you're thankful that we are together this morning. He says, don't give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. And uh, these people here, the way the empty chairs are. <laughs> no. But, so, you know, it's, it's so good to be together because we encourage one another, we strengthen one another, we build one another's faith. It's the highlight and the beginning of the week. This is not the end of a difficult week or a long week. This is the beginning of a fresh week, an opportunity to worship God, an opportunity to encourage ourselves in faith and to meet with Him. And so we come together, we have a sense of what might happen because we do it every week. But also we don't know what might happen because we meet with the living God. And uh, it's not a service, but it's a gathering. It's a meeting around his throne. And so this is the opportunity we have. And we can do that no matter, no matter what we feel about ourselves or what do we think about our life or our, our qualification to come. We can come with a full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled uh, to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. So if you have a guilty conscience this morning, put it aside because God invites you into his presence. And so I'm going to pray and then I'm going to ask James Setter and the team to lead us in worship this morning. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be together. We thank you for the privilege that it is to come into your presence, that it's not a chore, it's not a bind, it's not a duty, it's a pleasure that we come and we gather around your throne. And Father, as we do so, I pray that you would fill our hearts with faith, that you would open up our hearts and our minds to see you afresh, to see you in ways we haven't done before. Lord God, maybe whether it's years and years of experience we have or whether we're new to all of this, Father, I pray that we will be blown away by a revelation of who you are this morning, Lord God, that we would see you more clearly than ever. I pray for those that are carrying heavy burdens this morning in here, maybe completely unseen, completely unspoken, but yet you see it, Lord God, and I pray that you give them the grace to cast their burdens onto you because you do care. I pray that there, that there will be a transformation that goes on in the next two hours in this place, Lord God, though, so that as we come in, we will leave this place completely different completely refreshed, renewed, energized, encouraged, built up with our eyes open to see the confidence and the assurance that we can have in you, Jesus. I thank you that you're not just a name that we take for our lives. You're not just a, a label that we place upon ourselves, 
but you are the living God who calls us into your presence and, uh, and has removed all barriers that we might freely come and freely enjoy all the goodness that we find in your presence. And so fill this place, we pray, with the aroma, with the glory, with the, with the, the tangible presence of God as we lift our hearts in worship to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks, James Setter. Amen. amen. This morning. <laughs> so we want to sing Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Amen.
Yeshu. Wow. Lord Jesus, we welcome you here. This song is forever yours. These are our songs that we lift this morning. And it's so good. It's Palm Sunday today. Now, we don't, we don't as, uh, have a, a, a strict calendar where we mark these things, but we should be aware of, uh, of these things uh, in the lead up to Easter Sunday, next Sunday. And so I would encourage you to read and to think about and to, and to focus on the events uh, leading up to Easter Sunday. And as we celebrate New Life next Easter, next Sunday, we have Baptism Day as well, which is uh, a really exciting uh, development. We've got a number of baptisms scheduled through the year, but uh, at the time that we put this out, people have come forward, and uh, I was just about to triumphantly declare the number, and then I wasn't too sure. How many is it? Five. Five. Five, way, five baptisms next week. So uh, please do come early, get a seat. One four six will be open, I believe, for streaming, so you'll be able to see. Um, not literal streaming, because Steve's very good at waterproofing the whole system. But um, we, uh, uh, so 146 will be there, and we'll have the baptistry all set up here. And uh, it's going to be great. It's going to be a great celebration of, uh, of new life and faith and a recognition that Jesus is alive. Not only is he alive, but he's working in the lives of people. So do come along. Don't miss it. Uh, in no particular order... The, on Saturday, Easter Saturday, the men's prayer breakfast uh, that was scheduled for Unit 2 at 7.30 in the morning. Alan has said that he hasn't had too much response, and so he's inclined to move it to his house. Now, I did say that it may be that people didn't know to respond. So if you, if you were wanting to come, and there's more than eight people or, or so that want to come, it can move back to Unit 2, but we need to know today. So I don't know if there's anybody that wouldn't normally be going to the men's prayer breakfast that would be going next Saturday morning. If you can put your hand up, please. Jim and Alan. Chris. Jim. Chris. Chris. You. Ian. Me. Johnny. Johnny. Your dad. I, I do now. No, I did know. I did know. My dad. Oh, yeah, there's lots of people going. So can we move it back, Alan? <laughs> Unit two. So that was, that was good use of notice time, wasn't it? <laughs> We've got, so 7.30, don't, don't let us down now, because uh, we don't want to be rattling around in Unit two. Uh, 7.30 on Saturday morning, men's prayer breakfast. That's good. Um, on the... I've written it down. Newcomer's lunch, and the date's gone out of my head. 14th. 14th. On the 14th of April, we have a newcomer's lunch, which is an opportunity for people that are uh, new to the church, don't know too much about the church, uh, you know, to, to gather together after the Sunday service, where we'll have lunch together, and a uh, little bit of a, an explanation about what the church is, what we're seeking to be, how you can get involved, different ways of connecting, etc., etc. And so please do, we're going to put up a, uh, a sign-up uh, thing for that. So please uh, note that date. If, that, if you feel that that is you and you'd like to be part of that, then uh, just note that ahead of time and we will get a sign-up sheet sorted and, uh, and, and so we've got numbers for lunch and everything else. But uh, there's, it, yeah, that's going to be a, a really good and positive event. has been in the past and, uh, and will be good uh, to do again. And there's no prayer meeting this evening um, because that's on a fortnightly basis. Uh, there is a prayer day incoming. We had a prayer day a few weeks ago. We've got another one on the 27th of April uh, where we uh, pray throughout the day at ver different slots uh, using the buildings that we've got. And then uh, we are planning in the early evening to have an hour uh, gathering for everybody here so we can pray together on that evening as well. So that's the 27th of April. Sunday at four this afternoon, that's a, uh, a smaller, more interactive uh, meeting that happens in this place. And if you'd like to be part of that, 
uh, and you don't know what it's all about, then please do see me and I can uh, explain and point you in the right direction. But that will be on this afternoon at 4 o'clock. We always wave and say hi to 146. Hello, 146 again. Um, you might not know what that means, uh, but we have uh, uh, one of our buildings over the other side of what used to be the old Jordan Thorpe pub behind the library. There was then a, a preschool nursery. We've bought that building, and that's the one we're in the process of uh, looking to renovate and to, to build up. But in the meantime, what we do is we have a more relaxed cafe-style service over there uh, on a, a Sunday morning. It's a streaming of this, so you get to watch this on the screen, and, uh, but you can have tea and coffee throughout. Um, it's a bit like first class. Um, <laughs> whereas this is, this is more easy jet. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so there we go. So uh, if you like, don't all rush over there, by the way. We need people here. We need the easy jet people. Uh, a soldier is in no particular order. Next week, Good Friday, uh, which is Friday, um, 10.30 10 in the morning, we have a one-hour service, communion service, that is going to be led by Cornelius and Sarah. Great. Reflective service. So uh, there won't be any particular uh, activities planned for the children, but children can come. But we'll obviously we'll give them some, some space and some things to do or whatever. But it's a one-hour uh, focused uh, service reflecting on Good Friday uh, before the Easter Sunday service, uh, baptism service. Uh, there's the what's on sheet out the front. There's the welcome pack for you if you haven't had one of those before and you're new. It's full of uh, all sorts of goodies uh, explaining various different things that go on in the life of the church during the course of the week. Roz. Where are you? Grab a, grab a mic. Good morning, everybody. Sorry, I know it's a very busy week and I'm adding something else on to it, I'm afraid. Uh, but uh, we'd love you to encourage what we're doing with Friends of Batemore Park. So this uh, when, coming Wednesday, 7 o'clock in the library, we've got our AGM. Now, this doesn't mean to say if you come to the AGM that we will try and enroll you into Friends of Batemore Park. This is just to come and find out, encourage us in what we're doing, come and find out what's happening, and uh, uh, we'll be a review of the year. You'll hear what, uh, what we're hope planning for the coming year, uh, some new initiatives that are happening which are involving the church. So it'll be very interesting to come. And then we're going to have a break for tea and coffee. And at 8 o'clock, we've got Beth White as our guest speaker. And some of you will know that she uh, is a youth worker for this area. And she meets on a Wednesday with the youth in Unit 2. Uh, she's actually outgrowing it because she's doing such a brilliant job. There's so many young people that uh, are coming off the streets, really, that are now meeting there and having more of a positive life. So it'd be great, even if you can't come to the first bit, to come and listen to, to what Beth White is doing. Now, in between, we're going to be serving drinks, and that's always a bit chaotic. So if anybody can help and come and serve drinks, so we maybe would release Steve and myself to, to talk to people, we'd very, very much appreciate that. All the cups will be set out. There'll be milk. There'll be biscuits. It's just a case of uh, serving. So if you can come and support us, we'd really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Wednesday at 7. Sunday at 4, Wednesday at 7. All the different things. Right. Don't think I've forgotten anything. Leave a pregnant pause for somebody to shout. Nope. We've got, uh, we're going to have some testimonies and some prayer and, uh, and Ian's got a word to share a little bit in a little while. Um, but in the meantime, we are going to take our offering. Uh, Claudia and Sheila are going to help with that. And I'm going to ask the worship team if they come back. The video will go up. Uh, different ways that you can give, either physically here or by, via text message or bank transfer or through the website. Thank you.
Just for a, a, a few minutes. Um, Sheila. It's Sheila. Sheila's going to come and share with us. Are you okay? Yeah. Thank you. This is just a testimony about something that's been going on for the last couple of months. Two or three weeks ago, thinking ahead a bit about Genesis, this year-long series, and the display in the front entrance, I asked Catherine at Sunday at four if she had any colouring pictures of Joseph in his multicoloured coat. With the intention then of asking Keith who likes colouring and has multicoloured pens, to colour one in. Catherine replied, no, she hadn't. While she was telling me where to find one on the internet, I went and sat down next to Keith, who was already busy colouring. And what was he colouring? A picture of Joseph and his brothers. And then he showed me the book, The Story of Joseph, the whole book, colouring pictures of Joseph. And not only that, but he added that Roz had only just given it to, to him that morning. When church-related things start clicking into place alongside each other like this, Jonathan has always referred to it as joining the dots. Since I started doing the Genesis Notice Board in January, with nothing more than a poster in the middle and no plan in my mind of how to fill the rest of the space, it's been raining dots. Things have been turning up as and when I need them, as if on cue. As the Bible says, God will meet all your needs, and it has certainly felt like he's con orchestrating this. Another example that wowed me in January was when I discovered, by chance, if you can call it that, on YouTube, the Ark Encounter. If you have a picture in your mind of Noah's Ark, storybook fashion, a little boat with a house on top, think again. Because in Kentucky, the USA, a replica has been built, constructed to biblical spe specifications. Its size is breathtaking. Inside, there are seven stories, 
and it takes five hours to go round. A wooden construction like no other in the world and built to be entirely evangelistic. Conceived in 2004 and opened in 2016, the actual date 7-7, chosen deliberately to match Genesis 7-7, which says Noah entered the ark. It is equipped with everything Noah and his family and animals would have needed on this indeterminate voyage. Then the Lord shut him in. As the door closed, Noah must have experienced that moment of there's no going back. It's inspirational stuff. These men of faith who walked the earth so long ago. And I'm trying to reflect that in the way the display in the front entrance is evolving. These are just two instances, a testimony to the timing and provision of God that I've seen in this. There are others. Visiting Sheffield Cathedral to see threads of creation. Standout statements from some of you and pictures of doves and rainbows. And the week I'd been looking for an appropriate map to put up and Johnny included one in his talk. The first five words in the Bible are, in the beginning, God created. We are made in his image to be creative. Throughout history, people have been inspired by the stories of Genesis. This word, whose definition is birth, <coughs> sorry, forgive me, throat. This def um, whose definition is birth, beginning, creation. Let us all at MCF be inspired too. For in our own way, in 146, we are also at the beginning of creating something new, evangelistic, like no other, certainly on this estate. At the conception of the Ark Encounter, when members of the Amish community were consulted, being world experts in the construction of wooden buildings, one of them said, maybe God has been preparing us all these years just for this. Thank you. I would encourage you to have a look at Sheila's board out there. It's remarkable uh, work there. And uh, I'm not sure how much space there is for the rest of the series, but... Uh, <laughs> It's brilliant work. Erica said, that's all right then. <laughs> yeah, we're going to go on to the ceiling. Brilliant. Yeah. The planets and the solar system and all of that will be great. Um, okay. uh, Pauline just uh, had a brief testimony on Genesis as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, this morning we're going to have something on Genesis 12. And uh, that was something that I just wanted to talk about. So I brought my old Bible. And uh, my mother bought me this. And inside it says, Easter 1953. So that's going back a long time. And uh, so I thought, well, you know, I know Jesus. I have to know my life. But when I was 12, I thought, I really ought to get baptized because I need to tell people I belong to Jesus. And it took another seven years because the church we were in, we didn't have a baptistry. And I don't think there were the ones like we have nowadays here at, at that time. But uh, I stepped going on with the Lord. And uh, I got my Bible and I thought, well, I've never read it all the way through. I must start. I was 17 then. So uh, I started, and in my second week, I got to Genesis chapter 12. And of course, the Bibles that we all had in those days were the authorized, or the King James Version. I'll just read you the verse that spoke to me. It was the first verse of chapter 12. Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And uh, so I took that verse, that was for me. 
because at that time I was thinking, what am I going to do with my life? I worked in Woolworths and I loved it. And I was going on to be uh, an auditor eventually. And uh, I thought, well, I do like my work, but um, what has God got for me? And I read that verse and uh, said to get out from your father's house and so on. And so I thought, well, maybe God was calling me to the mission field somewhere. And uh, so I just kept working because there was nothing on straight away that the Lord showed me apart from the fact that he would show me where I had to go. And uh, years went by and I started to train in different ways towards going to the mission field. And eight years later, I was on a ship going to India. And so the Lord had fulfilled that promise. And he still keeps his promises. And that we're still on the road, all of us, no matter where it's going to, well, we know where it's going to lead, to the better country eventually. But um, just now, I'm still on the road, and uh, 71 years later. <laughs> Final proof that God is a Yorkshireman. Eh? Get the out. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. We're going to uh, pray, I mean, that's why they're ask the, and as we pray, and then we'll lead into another section of, uh, of worship. But um, Ian, did you want to share the word? Thanks. Um... I don't know what I'll do if something doesn't change. I don't know what I'll do. That's the phrase that came in my mind earlier. Uh, I don't know if you know this, the Holy Spirit can at the same time be joyous with some people, but at the same time can really understand when someone is in pain. So this is a serious word I want to give. While we were worshipping earlier, this came to me very strongly. I felt the Spirit say to me, there's someone here where it's, if something doesn't change, I don't know what I'll do. And I felt, as the Spirit was talking to me, it's quite desperate for someone. And so for that person, and I, I sort of know who it was, I think I know who it was, I just want to say this, be brave and come and see someone later and tell them how bad it is and what needs to change. Uh, come and find me and I'll pray with you, but it won't just be me, I will bring others in. Uh, if Merle is free, my wife, she'll, but she's counting I think, so we'll find someone else. God has things to say to you, and he does want the situation to change. Okay? The phrase you've had in your mind is, if it doesn't change, I don't know what I'll do. All right? If that's you, be brave. Come and see someone at the end. Talk to them. I don't want to call you out now. It's not about that. It's about giving you a rescue plan. And God is with you in this. Yeah. So the remarkable thing is as we pray, it can be as close and as intimate as that and, and as knowledgeable. God sees deep into, the, into what's going on in our hearts and calls us out, but at the same time calls us to pray for, uh, pray for ourselves, pray for one another, pray for our church, pray for our city, pray for our world. And, uh, and so that's what... Uh, we're going to do. There's so many things that uh, have been in the news. It's really interesting and sad to see the statement by um, Kate Middleton, the Princess of Wales, about the situation that she's in. Um, but again, it, and again, we need to pray for her and her family on a human level. But at the same time, it reminds me that the world is shaking. That we've had, uh, we said that things would change when the Queen passed away. 70 years, or, or it feels like almost invincibility, and now it feels like things that seem certain have feet of clay, and, uh, and the, the king is sick, and uh, you know, and it's not, it's not about the, the people we have to pray for them as human beings, but it just reminds us that the world we live in is shaking, and that you only have to turn on the news to the war in Russia, Ukraine, uh, Israel, Gaza, and all that's going on, the suffering, the, the uncertainty, the fear, the pain, everything that is going on around us. 
And as we pray into those situations, not only do we pray with, uh, with empathy and we pray, we intercede for those situations and for those people, we also stretch our perspective to remind ourselves that the Lord reigns, that he is in control, that he is on the throne. When the, the Psalms say, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. And it says, the Lord enthroned in heaven laughs. Not laughs because he's mocking the situation, but he laughs because he's in control. These things that cause us so much fear and uncertainty and insecurity, actually the Lord is in control, complete control. And as we pray, we need to remind ourselves of that. And so... I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask that we pray together and, uh, and there'll be people that are on your mind, situations that are on your heart. Bring those to the Lord as well as we do. And then as we come to the end of that period, then the, I'm going to ask the worship team to pick it up again and, uh, and lead us again into the presence of God. So let's pray together, shall we? Lord, we come to you. We're reminded of that refrain that says you are God in heaven and we are here on earth and there's it's like there's there's a there's a gap and yet you call us to intercession you call us to pray you call us to close that gap and you close it by the presence and power of your Holy Spirit and Lord God as your spirit moves amongst us we pray for situations here for that word that Ian has shared for whoever is carrying that burden Lord God we pray this morning we thank you for your kindness We thank you for your care. We thank you that though there is so much going on, your eye is on the sparrow. Your eye is on us. Your eye is on our personal circumstances, Lord God. And so we bring those to you. We bring our family circumstances to you. We bring uh, our personal circumstances to you. We bring our... The, the, the situations surrounding us day by day that burden us so much, we bring them to you now, Lord, and say, will you do something? That word, you know, if something doesn't happen, I don't, if something doesn't change, I don't know what I'll do. You are the God who brings change. You are the God who brings the, the pivotal moment, the crisis moments that seem like everything is lost and then the, the sun begins to break through and the, and the hope begins to flow again. And I just pray, God, that, uh, that you would grant us faith to see change in our own circumstances, in the circumstances of our family, people that we love, people that we work with, people that we walk with day by day. Lord God, we lift those situations to you. We pray for our nation. We pray for our royal family. Lord God, and all of this news coming out about sickness and cancer and all the things that that brings, Lord God, from a, again, from a human level, your eye is on the sparrow. Your eye is on the, the, the king, the man. Your eye is on the princess of Wales, the woman, the mother, the daughter. And we pray for her. We pray for your mercy. We pray for your healing power. We pray for your strength to come. We pray for faith. They talk about faith and hope. I pray that that faith and hope would be real in their hearts and their minds, Lord God. We remind ourselves again that of the uncertainty and the insecurity of life. We thank you that the world is shaking because, Father, in that there is an opportunity for us to find a foundation that never shakes, that never breaks, that never falls. And so we pray. God, that in the midst of all this fear and uncertainty and insecurity, all the the division and the hatred and all the 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 negativity and the toxicity that flows around us all the time, whether it's in the media or in uh, on on, you know wherever we encounter it, Lord God, I pray that we as the as your people would be people of faith, that we would hold on to you. Lord God, and we, were pr- and we pray that, they w- that this would be the groundwork for a move of God like we've never seen. We pray for an outpouring of your Spirit, Jesus. We pray for, uh, we remind ourselves of that verse that said, uh, uh, that Isaiah spoke, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. In the year that everything fell about, I saw the Lord. In the year that the wheels came off, I saw the Lord. In the year of my crisis, I saw the Lord. And in the year... Where, where there seems to be no hope, there seems to be no future, there seems to be no direction, there seems to be just chaos on every turn. In that year, we saw the Lord. We will see the Lord. We will still see the Lord. You will still have the final say. 
you will still move in power, Lord God. And we thank you for the baptisms that are coming up. We thank you for the, for the evidence that that is of your spirit moving amongst us and in our own community. And yet, Father, we know that is just the first fruits. And we pray for more and more and more because this is the route to life. As uh, Pauline said, our journey doesn't end here. Our journey doesn't end with what we do in this life, but our journey ends in a better country, in a, in a, in a, in a glorious place. The, where, as the kingdom of God is established. And I pray that more and more and more people will find that route to the kingdom of God, will find uh, comfort, will find strength, will find peace, will find joy. Lord God, that that will be the transformation, that when things seem so dark, when the darkness clouds in, then your light will be even greater, shine even stronger. And that Jesus would be a household name in this community, in our community, and in this nation again. Lord God, we thank you for our heritage. That, 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 that We look back in history and we see the, the impact that the gospel has had over so many years. And you haven't brought us to a point where it's all just going to fall about our ears. But Lord God, there is still yet, there are still greater things to be done. Greater things to be seen. And we thank you for what you're doing. We pray. Uh, about these situations, these, the, 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 the wars and everything else that is going on, the, the hatred and the violence. It's, the, it, it's, a, it's a horrible manifestation of spiritual realities, the enemies of God rising up. I thank you, your word says, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Arise, Lord, we pray, in these situations where there's pain, where there's suffering, where there's, where there's warfare, Lord God, arise and have your way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The same. Hallelujah.
tunnel, a narrow tunnel, and it was going down and down. A little lifts up, but then down again, almost like one of these fairground rides, but it was going down. And it just went on and on, and I just feel like whoever this is talking to is feeling like that, that there's just no way out. And then I saw like a, a light to the left as we were going down, but the opportunity was missed. I hope this is making sense. And then it, again, this tunnel went down and there's little lifts, but it's mainly down, going deeper and deeper until it just feels like it's never going to come back up. And then again, there was a light to the left, an, an opportunity. A, and as, you were, as you're going past, there's an opportunity to grab someone's hands that's waiting for you. I believe it's Jesus' hands waiting to get hold of you and lift you out of this situation. And I desperately felt, do not miss this opportunity. If you're in here, if you're in 146, come across. And speak and be prayed for and, and let others share in that because we're all God's children. What hurts one hurts us all. Please, please do not miss this opportunity. Yeah. No lion, the dependable one, the one on whom you can lean, the one in whom you can trust, the one in whom you can take assurance that I will deliver. For I am the dependable one. You may not need that. You may not think you need that. But I am the one on whom you alone can depend. So lean on me. Lift your eyes. Look afresh. Grasp at faith. The things that I declare. Because I am the dependable one. Well, they have. <laughs> yeah, I think that was a remarkable moment, actually. This God just, you know, as we sing, break our walls down. Sheila just shared with me. It was a word, wasn't it, about God as we praise, God breaking out. Yeah. Randomly, but he's not knocking bricks out, yeah. And Bringing us to freedom. I mean, God is moving amongst us, yeah. I want to give space uh, for the word now as uh, time is going, but that's not a departure from where God has brought us to. Sheila mentioned the phrase joining the dots, and I believe in uh, our meetings uh, together, it's like a, a table full of things, and God joins the dots, and there are things that He wants to say. And I believe that, uh, although I don't know what is being going to be said, I believe that God has things to say to us that will connect into all the things that, uh, that he's already done. And uh, this morning we've got uh, two for the price of one. We've got Andy and Jensen. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to say any more than that, except I'll pray for them. And then Andy's going to uh, introduce... Uh, what's going to happen. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence amongst us this morning. We thank you all that you're doing. We thank you for the, the tangible sense of your presence, Lord God. Yeah. And we believe you've brought us to this point. And we believe you've given Andy and Jensen your word to yeah. speak, yeah. to join the dots, to add to all that you've, uh, you've been bringing us to this morning. And so I just pray that you give them great ease, uh, peace, deal with the nerves, whatever. Yeah. Give them great grace to deliver the word that you've given them in Jesus' name. Amen.
So I've, no, I've known Jensen and his family for a good few years now, uh, and Jensen actually faithfully serves some weeks at the back, doing the role that Graham's doing at the moment, which is brilliant. Uh, and we were chatting a few weeks ago, and I was just asking him, would you ever fancy having a go at doing at the talk on a Sunday morning? Uh, and uh, he said yes. Hey. So the way we're going to do it this morning, we're doing chapter 12, as you heard, and Jensen's going to start, do the first part, and I'm going to do the second part, is what we've agreed. But I have said, you know, it can be quite daunting standing here looking at a sea of faces, but I have told them that you're all very nice, and that you're all, and that you're all rooting for him. All right, so that's great. Okay, there you go. Right. Good morning. Good morning. As much as I appreciate that reception, you have to give the same for Andy when he comes up, otherwise it's not fair. All right. All right. That, that's the deal. That's the deal with me doing this. I'll just give a quick, quick sort of introduction of myself to people who don't know me. So as Andy said, I'm Jensen. I've been coming here for some years, nine years, I think it is. So since I was nine, I hope that doesn't make any of you feel too old. Um, and yeah, I help, I help with the, the projector at the back. And yeah, so I think we had this chat a couple of weeks ago, like you were saying. We won't, we won't talk about that specifically, just sort of came up in conversation and it's just sort of led on from there. Um, but yeah, this morning I'll be, t- I'll be doing the first nine verses of Genesis chapter 12 and then Andy's going to hopefully pick up if everyone's still awake and, and carry on. Um, chapter 12 is, well, as Pauline introduced, this is about Abram and Darren did brilliantly last week. Um, just, and it, it was mentioned but it wasn't really gone into that much. So if it's all right, um, Graham, can we get the... Perfect. It's that clockwork, isn't it? (laughs) So I'll read. You'd have to stand up or read it out. You can just sort of follow along. And we're just trusting my reading ability. So the Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife, I'm I'm assuming that's like Sarai, but I'll just call her Sarah. His nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. (laughs) Abram travelled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of... That one. At the, thank you. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on towards the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent. When Bethel on the west and. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that, I was going to say that, but. Uh, on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the, the name of the Lord. So they're the first nine, nine verses. I'm going to sort of break this down. You can, thank you, Graham. I'm going to try and break this down as, as best I can into sort of three sections. So the first three, the middle sort of three, and then the end three. So that's just the way I've sort of done it. So in the first verse, God says to Abraham, go for your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you, which is is a big, a big sort of ask of, of Abraham to leave everything he knows, everything he's been comfortable with, everything, you know, that he's been, it says in, um, I think it's verse 5 or verse uh, 4, that he's 75 years old. So you can assume he's probably done a good stint there. So, so you know, where he's been for the last few years and, and just to sort of up and leave to the land I will show you. I, I will do that for the land I will show you. Just, I'm just quoting it. But, um, and that, yeah, like I was saying, that's not, a, not an easy thing to do, you know. He doesn't know sort of like... So the food situation, the sort of water situation, you know, basic things, housing. It's going to be anywhere to, you know, park his camel, stuff like that. Um, and it, it would take a, an immense amount of trust in God, in God's word, to be able to say, yeah, you know what? I'm going to say, I'm not going to ask any questions. I hear what you're saying, I'm going to go and I'm going to do it. I'm going to leave everything I know. I'm going to take everything I know and I'm going to move out, all right? I've been, um, I've been working at the, the Northern General for about six months now. And every single morning, I take the same route to work. Sometimes I start with my dad, sometimes I start with my mum's. It's not much difference. But I, I could tell you all the route, but I'm not going to, you know, I hope that you're all still awake by the end of it. But, um, but I take the exact same route every day. And I have to, I have to have Google Maps on. Because I won't, I don't trust myself to go there without it. I know exactly where I'm going. I know exactly, you know, the sort of 
the road's only taken if, if it's a bit, gonna, you know, if I'm going to be late, I'll take this way. If I'm going to be early, I'll take this way. But every single time I have to see where I'm going to be able to think, yeah, I, I'm confident I can get there. But, you know, I can't imagine someone saying to me, let alone go to a different site and work today, or, you know, go to work without seeing where you're going, because I need that sort of visual input. So for Abraham to be able to say, yeah, I'm going to listen to what God's saying, I'm going to go somewhere, I don't know where I'm going, he's going to show me on my route and not be able to, you know, see like a map or a final destination or anything like that. It takes a, a you know, a big amount of trust and, and, you know, Landau will show you. It's not, it's not massively informative, is it? So, <laughs> you know, and, and leaving the country is, is one thing, but, you know, leaving to go to a, a random other country is another. Um, and, you know, over the first three verses, God is promising a lot to Abraham. He says, make you into a great nation and I will bless you. Make your name great and you will be a blessing. And, and uh, bless those who bless you. Curse those who curse you. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So, again, promise, uh, God is promising a lot if Abraham is ob- obedient to his instructions and trusts him. You know, I, I will bless those who bless you. So, you know, everyone he meets will be blessed through him. And I'll protect you by cursing those who curse you. And it's a big, a big promise, which only can come from God. That can't come from any humanly source. You know, and trusting in God's word will give you these, these things that no human can provide. So just a quick recap for the first three. God has told Abram to go somewhere that he will show him, and in return has promised to bless and protect him. Is it all right if we could just get uh, four and five up, Graham, please? So I'm just going to reread them just to familiarize myself. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife, yeah, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. So, fortunately, Abram makes the right decision by trusting God's words, and, and he, he sets out, you know, Abram went as the Lord had told him. He took his wife and his nephew with him. And that sort of comes back in with the, you know, being able to trust God and being obedient of God's instructions, which are two very linked, linked things in this sort of passage of verses. Because if he, he can, it's all good trusting God and saying, yeah, I trust your word and I, I know that you'll bless and protect me. But if he doesn't act on those and be obedient on those instructions, well, he's, well first of all, he's not going to leave, so he's not going to get to the land I will show you. He won't get to see whatever wonderful place that might be. But, you know, he's, he's also not going to be blessed because as much as he's trusting in God, he's not doing what God's asking him to do. And, you know, this sort of, sort of being obedient and trusting God's word can be found in, you know, multiple parts of the Bible. I think the main one that stuck out to me was Noah and Noah's Ark. Because God has said, look, you need to build a boat. I did a bit of research as well, actually. So, the, uh, apparently, Noah's Ark was 450 feet long. And a Boeing 747 is about 270 feet. The Titanic was 800 feet. So, you know, it's a good, a good size. And, you know, you don't have, like, a crane or anything like that. So, you know, it, t- it would have taken him a long time. It's not a five-minute five job. So God asking him to do this is, is a big thing. So, you know, Abraham to leave his country, leave everything he knows, leave everything he's comfortable with, and Noah to build a, a big ark and get two of every animal and, and take his family and, and survive a flood. Um, it, it's, a, it's a big ask. And these decisions, you know, everyone will have decisions in their own life where you trust in God's word. I think... It's important to seek out and, and seek his, his direction and be able to trust in his word and be obedient of whatever he tells you. So I've currently got a, a decision to make myself regarding sort of what I'm doing in my future. Um, I currently work, like I've been saying, but got a place for university in September to do physiotherapy, which is where I'm working now. And I've got a decision to make. Do I carry on working where I'm working? And, you know, there's some other things that I won't go into that affect my decision or go to university. And, and praying and seeking out God's instruction on this is, is sort of the t- route I'm taking. It's the right, oh, so I'm assuming that's the, the right route. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so praying and seeking out God's instruction. But then there's always the, the possibility that God will say to me, look, this is a really good option. This is a really good option, but I want you to do this. And that, if God tells me to do that thing, I'm going to have to trust him. Because I don't know what that might lead me into, and I don't know where that might take me. But trusting in God's word and being obedient to the instructions will take me on the best path I can get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, but yeah, just going back, so, so Noah being obedient of God's word saved him, saved his family. Abram being obedient of God's word 
is going to deliver him safely to where God wants him to get, uh, want, where God wants him to get to. So yeah, so Abram has agreed in, and he's gathered everything he owns and all his people, and being obedient of God's instruction. As everyone noticed, um, in verse five, God makes a, uh, Abram makes a very, very quick one-verse journey. He sets off from Haran and arrives in, in the same sentence. <laughs> so I, I don't know if he's if he's camel had wheat bits for breakfast or. Is it right if we get verses uh, six and seven up, please? <laughs> yeah, there we go. Abram travelled through the, the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moray. At the <laughs> at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, "To your offspring, I will give this land." So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. So. You know, in, in these verses it says, to your offspring I will give this, give this land. But at the time it wasn't, wasn't theirs to own. It was, it, the Canaanites owned the land. And there isn't any sort of mention of how this, this changeover in ownership of the land happens. So I'm going to sort of push that to one side and we'll ignore that. But it, it's, it's again trusting in God and, yeah. and he's promising this to him. It's not saying, look, if you go there, I'll live you there safely. But it's sort of your own, you need to sort of everything out yourself. It's... I'll, look, this is what I want you to do. I'm going to take you there. You're going to get there safely. You'll be a blessing to people. And when you get there, it'll be yours to own, for your offspring's to own. And that sort of thing is it's not being able to say, look, you're going to get delivered here, and it'll be yours. Don't worry about it. It's very, very easy to ask. It, for Abraham, it would have been easy to ask, how? How is that going to happen? Why, like, why, why is this happening? But he doesn't, as, well, as far as it's documented. And it's... It's a term that, um, that Andy used when I was talking to him the other day. And it's, trust is the bedrock of our faith. So being able to trust in God and trust that he's going to say, look, this is what's going to happen, and then he's going to do it and follow through on it. And, you know, the questionless faith and questionless trust. So not asking questions and not sort of saying, right, I know this is what you tell me to do, but I don't understand how you're going to do it. How are you going to, how's this going to happen? How's this going to happen? Why is this happening? That sort of, that sort of thing is... is Obviously not, Abraham doesn't do that. He just sort of trusts God and thinks, right, this is what's happening, I know what I'm doing, I'm going to do it. And he just, and it, well, as follows, obviously. But as I think especially for me, for example, if someone asks me to do something that might seem sort of outlandish or strange, I will, I will want to know why, and I will want to know how, you're going to, how am I going to do that. And I think it would be the same with anyone in the room. You know, I'm not, not going to point fingers or anything, but I'm sure in everyone's own life they've thought, right, God's telling me to do this, how is this going to happen? How am I going to be able to pull this off? How is it going to work? But, and it's not something that's, that's easy, and it's not something you can do sort of first time around. You know, if God says, right, I want you to move country, and I want you to help these people out here, or I want you to go on this mission and help these people out, it's, it's not something that you can say, right, okay, I'll just do it. You know, it would be, especially if it's that first time you've been asked to do it, you would want to ask how, you'd want to know why, wouldn't you? So, I think, yeah, that, that sort of questionless faith is something that I know I'm working on, I'm sure people here today are also working on it themselves, so. Um, but yeah, and then it, it sort of, it, it carries on, um, uh, verse 7, 8, and 9, to, uh, if we could get them up, Graham, please. I'm keeping you busy today, aren't I? Sorry about that. <laughs> the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on towards the hills east of Bethel, and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So it's for the rest of this sort of end of my nine verses, is, is, he's, he's built an altar where he can worship the Lord and where he can remember this encounter with God and remember what he's promised to him. And sort of just not let that sort of God's instructions slide, if that makes any sense. So not letting what God's told him go under the radar, like, it's not his decision. He's not chosen to do this, he's been told to do it, and he's done it, and now look where he is. And he's got to honour that by building an altar and praising God for it. Yeah, um, yeah so, uh, and he, he continues on his journey, and he eventually gets there, building altars uh, uh, on arrival, so. If you're going to take anything sort of away from, from this short, sort of, I don't know how long it's been, <laughs> amount of time I've been speaking for, it would be two things, three things. One is trusting in God's word. 
Two is be obedient of its instructions, however strange or peculiar or sort of outlandish it might seem. And three, I'm, I'm not great at public speaking, but I feel like I've done a good job. <laughs> I hope Andy gets this reception as well. I'll, I'll be watching you as I'm sort of going outside to try and stop shaking and sweating nervously. But, uh, <laughs> but thank you, thank you. Great job, Jensen. Brilliant. So, so uh, uh, I've got what, 10 minutes? So, so this, this passage, uh, this story of Abraham in this chapter is just a tiny, tiny mirror of what it's like to become a Christian uh, and a tiny reflection of what it is to follow Jesus today. So, so we have at the beginning that God chooses Abraham, right? And, and for you and I as we're Christians, as we're following Jesus today, we might use the language that I've chosen Jesus or I've chosen to be a Christian, but the reality is behind that is that God has chosen you. Right, it's great news. So this story immediately speaks to us today. Uh, and the second thing that we see is that God then gives Abraham a plan and a purpose and sets him off, as Jensen's told us, on this journey, not knowing where he's going. Um, or as, as we heard from Pauline early, earlier, get thee out of thy country. Uh, and he sets him off on a purpose. And the same is true for you and me as we follow Jesus, that he gives us a plan and a purpose. We haven't chosen, and that's the problem with if we say we've chosen to follow Jesus, it kind of feels like it's for our benefit. But actually God has chosen you and has chosen you and given a purpose to you and to your life for you to take hold of. And then the next thing that Jensen's reminded us of is that God has promised, sent promises over Abraham. He promises to bless him. He promises about how numerous his children are going to be. He promises about his offspring occupying the land. And the same, you know what, is true for you and I, that God has spoken promises over your life that he will fulfill, that are true through the death and resurrection of Jesus and what was achieved on that cross. And God will always set out and fulfill his promises and not let them go. And so that, that's our first bit of the chapter. And then we get to the second bit of the chapter and it's just the same. It's just like following Jesus and being a Christian because we discover that Abraham makes a few mistakes, <laughs> makes a few bad decisions, <laughs> does something not quite right. And you know what? As Christians, we make a few mistakes. And we do some things that are, well, not quite right. Uh, and we have to ask the question, what's going on? So three things. I'm just going to read the second half of the chapter. Uh, if you don't have to put the words up, Graham, but I'm going to read them. If you want to follow them, please do. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abraham went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarah, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for, for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abraham came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that she was a very beautiful woman, and when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abraham well for her sake, and Abraham acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, men servants and maidservants, and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abraham's wife Sarah. So Pharaoh summoned Abraham, what have you done to me? He said, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say uh, she is my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here is your wife, poor woman. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abraham to his men and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. Three things, hopefully quickly, from this, uh, that I pulled out of this. The first thing is God, as, we, as Jensen told us, God, Abraham arrived at the land God had promised. He arrived at Canaan. And you think, great, I'm in the will of God. I've got the place that God's got in store for me. But what happens? Famine, that's right, a famine. Uh, there's a famine that God says, I have a plan, I have a purpose for you, this is it. But then famine, there's hardship, 
there's difficulty. And how many times do we equate being in the will of God with things going well, with things making sense, with things adding up, with life being smooth and okay, with relationships going well, with the church going woohoo and all that kind of stuff. Uh, And how many times do we think we're out of the will of God if things are difficult uh, and we're out of sorts with people and things are bad things are happening to us Uh, and we confuse that and it's a seduction of modern Christianity that we think things should be going well and it isn't true and I'm confident of that because Jesus said in this world you will have but take heart I have overcome the world so it's wrong of us when we think if things are going badly you know and the type of language we use I'll be blunt and I'll probably upset a few people is things like oh I'm under attack right and we use that sort of language and it kind of shifts what's really going on because the question we've got to ask all the time here is God still at work Is God still at work in Abraham's life while all this is going on? And we'll come back to that in a minute. You see, it it must have been hard for him. He thinks he's walking into God's plan. He's doing this amazing thing of faith and trust, as Jensen's reminded us. And yet he lands in this place of famine. But how often does the challenge come at the start of what God has called you to do? How often when God speaks and says promises into your life um, and wakes you up to see what he's got in store and you think yeah I'm going to make a step of faith here. How many times at the start of that do difficulties come? Just like for Abraham here. So often, right? Look at Noah building the ark and they all mock him and deride him. Look at Nehemiah trying to rebuild the city and the the, uh, opposition that he has to do that. Look at Jesus at the start of his ministry, led by the Spirit into the wilderness and tempted. Look at the early church as God moves so powerfully persecution breaks out against them. Time and again scriptures teach us and church history teaches us that when God moves in power and his people respond in faith that there is difficulty and hardship and conflict at that point in time. And the challenge we have is what are we going to do about that? 146 I don't know if you meant to say this earlier. I thought you did. Right, okay. (laughs) So, so so we're for 146. You know, we're in faith for what God has promised there and for what's going on. And we we mentioned at the family night the other week about the 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 applications we've put in for grant funding. And we talked about one we're going to the government that would cover the rest of the balance as we have it at the moment. And then we heard this week that we didn't get it. Uh, and we didn't get any of it, any, any of that money. So we have to look elsewhere. But, and we could think, oh, no, is God really in this? Is this really what he wants to do? No. No, God, we, we, we fall back yeah. just like Abraham on the promises of God. We fall back just like Pauline on the promises of God because he will fulfill what his word sets out over your life, over my life, over this church, over his church in this nation, over this community because it is born in the fact that he has chosen us and he has spoken promises over us. Second thing uh, out of this passage, we read that uh, he has to move to Egypt. Goes down to Egypt. He arrives at the place God has called him to. What next? He has to leave. Now, I don't know how the story goes, because as Jensen said, we don't get a lot of detail. But I can kind of imagine that as he moved his family and his servants and his animals and flocks from uh, from Haran all the way down to Canaan, they kind of had a sense, well, we're doing this because we're following God's word. And God has spoken to us and we're stirred up by it. And they kind of get to Canaan and you can see them going back to Abraham and saying, uh, this is, uh, so this is where God wants us, right? Uh, well, there's no food. We're going to die. And so Abraham has to get them all up again, round them all up again, say, right, we're going down to Egypt. Well, that's not where God wants us to go. He wants us here. Uh, And so uh, there's this challenge in this passage that he's reached the place God wants him to be. But actually, just to survive, he needs to go somewhere else for the time being. And this is, to, to me as I read this, I think this is a great lesson in that most spiritual gift of common sense. Right? Sorry, you won't find it in 1 Corinthians or Romans 8 or... 
Although it is, it is that, yeah. It is, it is the gift of wisdom, but it is the gift of common sense. And what I mean by that is, we have a tend- why didn't Abraham stay in Canaan and say, right, I'm in the place God has asked me to be. God will deliver me. God will deliver us. There's a famine here, but God will provide. And we have a great tendency and a danger to over-spiritualize things at times. That means we're trying to look for things, and God is saying, I just want you to exercise common sense. Right? Go where there is food, Abraham. And, and so he, he leaves. Um, you know, and, and it just strikes me that sometimes it's okay to respond to what's going on around and seemingly move away from the place God has called us to. That's what this teaches us. And why is that again? Because behind the scenes, it's God who has chosen Abraham. And God who has called Abraham. And God who has spoken promises over Abraham that he will fulfill. And the same is true for you and I. And we can move ourselves through common sense or other reasons to a different place that we don't really want to be. And I really don't want to be up here as a worship singer, believe me. right? But God will move powerfully because at the end of the day, your life and my life are actually lived out in a context that God has chosen you. And God has spoken promises over you. And it's not about what we're doing so much. It's about us learning what it is to trust God. And Abraham, as we know, is a man who is taught uh, through Scripture that he's a hero of the faith. That he's held up as the guy who is the father of the faith. That faith and trust are the things that, 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 that we remember him for. And yet he's got to learn that. And that is what's going on through this point, uh, this point in time. Sometimes it's not the message we want to hear, but sometimes we need to move, God moves us to a place where we need to move to a place just out of common sense. Remember COVID lockdown. Who wanted to be in that place? Right? But there's an element, and you might disagree with me, there's an element of common sense uh, about that. And just as I was thinking about it, um, so I credit to my wife here who who suggested strongly that I started keeping a list of things I could use as as analogies in sermons. And I was just looking through this one, and uh, uh, I don't know, Terry Terry Bamford, if you're in 146, but I've I've got jotted down here in my notes. On the 24th of May 2020, Angie and I visited Terry. So this is, what, two months into lockdown, uh, and he stood in his doorway, and we stood six feet back, and we chatted about the the message that had been out that morning uh, online. And I wrote down, visited Terry during lockdown. He'd listened to the service on the radio about the resurrection. The disciples had been fishing all night and not caught anything after the resurrection of Jesus. And Jesus told them to cast the net on the other side. And Terry said, what? and the message was, why should they do that? They know what to do. They've been doing it all night. Now God asks them to take a step of faith and try something different that they wouldn't have done anyway because that's not how they do it. And Terry, bless him, he compared that, he's telling us, compared that to being in lockdown. God has got us doing things that we never would have done because they were not part of our routine, not how we do things. And yet we've done it and God has blessed us. You know, bless you, Terry, for spotting something when we're in a place where we don't want to be and actually God is teaching us stuff. And the irony now is that Terry, I hope, is in 146 and the guys are in 146 with the benefit of stuff we learned to do in lockdown and stream stuff uh, out there. That's great. So the third thing I just want to bring out is, uh, in this story is there's this strange story about what he does with his wife, Sarah. You know, there's this cultural pressure being applied to Abraham as he ends up in Egypt. And how does he respond? You know, we've gone from the story of a man who is exercising faith and trust in God on this journey to a man who abdicates his own responsibility, makes his wife extremely vulnerable when he's supposed to protect her, and do all of that just to save his own skin. It's the same guy that's exercising faith and trust in following God to Canaan. How how do you exist? Well, first off, I'd say this is a great story of how God works with broken, mixed up people. Hallelujah. (laughs) Because we all do that, right? We all make mistakes. We all do things wrong. And God works in us. But the pressure of the culture and the circumstances conspired to make him act out of self-preservation rather than faith. 
And it's the same today when you and I, when we drift from the place of blessing, when we drift from the place that God has brought us to, when we lose that passion that we once had, and that singleness of vision when we first responded to him, then we become vulnerable to the pressures of society around us, of the circumstances we find ourselves, of the culture in which we live. And when that happens, we lower the bar. And we trust ourselves rather than trusting God. And we trust our gifts and abilities rather than trusting his promises. And we want to save our own skin rather than lean into the fact God has chosen us and called us by name. Everything about the gospel screams the opposite. Jesus resisted, not only resisted, but spoke out against the prevailing culture of his day, as did Paul and Peter and the other apostles as we go through the rest of the New Testament, as does the early church, as the church history, when you read through church history and see when the church is on fire for Jesus uh, and God is moving powerfully, they're speaking out against the ills of society of that day. So ask the question, how does the cultural pressure that we have today turn our eyes from the call of God on us to be more bothered about saving our own skin. You know, we haven't got time to go into that. I'll leave that for you to think about. Maybe that's a good bit of homework. But think, you know, how does, how does our succumbing to the advertising industry reduce us down to being more bothered about our own skin than actually following the call of God? How does the, 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 the proliferation of the entertainment industry and something that is so temporary and so uh, transient become something that's so important in, in the world today? How do we respond to that? How do we respond to the sexualization of everything and anything that is out there right now? How do we respond respond to the proliferation of technology that means I can do anything, good or bad, very easily. Thank you very much. I have a device in my hand. How do we respond to that? How do, we, how do we resist the culture around us trying to squeeze it into its mould uh, uh, and encouraging us to become men and women who are simply want to be quiet and not raise our head, but actually become men and women who hold on to his promises? How do we challenge the, the issues of sexuality, of gender confusion, confusion, of racism, of abortion, of the rich and poor divide, of the confused mishmash of values in society, all of which are complex? Right? I'm not simplifying that at all. But there's a tendency as Christians that, in this day and age to let that also squeeze us down and push us down. Uh, and like Abraham responding to the culture of his time, being more bothered about saving his own skin, rather than leaning back into and trusting the promises of God. He'd been called by God to a massive purpose, to be the father of nations, his faith in God to be a shining example, and in his following of God to reflect something of the Jesus that was to come. And we too, you and I, this morning, here in 146, watching online, we've been called We've been chosen by the same God that chose Abraham. We've been called and chosen by name. And we are being built into his church right now to be a light for the nations. To speak and live out the resurrection of Jesus. To pray his kingdom in. To pray the not yet kingdom into the here and now. So that we see him move and transform people's lives. What a calling that we have. It's massive. So let's stand together against the pressures around us and encourage one another. And let us learn to put others, not ourselves, first and pursue the glory of Jesus in this life with our strength and resolve together. Leaning into that very fact we had at the beginning, that it is God who has called us. And it is God who has given us a plan and a purpose. And it is God who has spoken promises over your life and our life. And so we can give ourselves to trust him. As Paul writes, uh, don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I'll just finish with, uh, for some strange reason, I've had a really old hymn from when I was a kid going around my head. Follow him, follow him. Yield your life to him. He has conquered death. He is king of kings. Accept the joy which he gives to those who yield their lives to him. Amen. Amen. We uh, are just going to continue a little while. Uh, the banner that says, please go and get your children, doesn't work.
So um, that's not an excuse. You still have to go and get them. Um, so if, uh, just as we continue, if I ask the worship team to come back, please, because um, it's now quarter two. If you, could, if you do have children uh, over there, please do go and, uh, and get them. Uh, if somebody can get a message to the uh, teenagers as well, that they, uh, they can finish as well. But we are just going to finish uh, with a little bit of worship. I said earlier on that God joins the dots. Well, no, Sheila said that, and I picked up on what she said. Um, but, and I really do feel that he has been doing. You know, the, one, the moment that I felt that uh, uh, God put his finger on this morning was when we were singing Break Our Walls Down. And there are so many walls that confine us, walls that stand in our way, walls of difficulty or challenge. Andy mentioned, uh, as he was speaking, I, uh, it became so clear to me the point about 146, and I had intended to mention that before, but I take it as God's timing to mention it after, that, you know, the, the challenges. We think, oh, it would be great to have all that grant money, and then we don't have it. And so, but we continue. We're not pushed back by the walls of circumstances or difficulty or challenge, whatever they are. There are walls that keep us where we are. There are walls that define and limit us. There are walls of culture and pressure, as Andy's just said, that confine us and squeeze us and, 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 and force us to be something that we don't want to be, that keep us where we don't want to be. And what God is doing, as it, and I believe that was what, uh, what the Spirit was doing amongst us as we sang that, just touching that, that nerve to say, Lord, break our walls down. Whatever it is that holds us, confines us, break our walls down. That's what he did in Abraham's life and Abraham's uh, experience and Abraham's journey, continually removing the walls, breaking the walls down. And we need to be prepared to be wall breakers people that will kick at walls, people that will do what it takes to, to push things out of our way. Sometimes it's, it's hard work to break a wall down. But that is what God is calling us to. And sometimes we just look at the wall and say, can't go any further, there's a wall there. But in actual fact, that's the, the cue to start kicking and start banging and start hammering to get those walls down. So let's sing that song again, shall we, as we uh, uh, draw our time to a close. Break our walls down. <laughs> the clue is in that title.
facing whatever barriers, whatever challenges, whatever difficulties, let that be our statement and our prayer. Jesus, I believe in you. I trust in you. Wherever you're leading me, wherever you're taking me, whatever you're asking of me, whatever you're challenging me with, Jesus, I believe in you and I trust in you. Amen. Let's say the words of the grace together, shall we? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. There will be tea and coffee served. Thank you.